Okay, today we talk about uh, prolonged pregnancy. Um, there's so much terminology around this topic. Uh, the first one is that um, we have what is called prolonged pregnancy. Um, it means that uh, prolonged pregnancy is a pregnancy that has um, gone beyond 294 days um, from the day of... Um, from the first day of the last uh, menstrual cycle. So that's a prolonged pregnancy. The other terminology we use for this condition is um, post-term pregnancy. We all know what term is. Term means any pregnancy that has uh, gone beyond uh, 37 weeks up to uh, 42 weeks. A pregnancy that goes beyond 42 weeks is called a post-term pregnancy. So the other name for a prolonged pregnancy is a post-term pregnancy. It means a pregnancy that goes beyond 42 weeks of gestation age. Um, the other term used for this same condition is post-deaths. Um, but there's a little bit of a technicality here. When we say post-deaths, uh, the usual question is what deaths are we referring to? So normally um, when we say deaths for a pregnancy, we are normally referring to two deaths. We are referring to the first day of the last menstrual cycle and we are referring to the EDD, the expected date of delivery. So when we say post-deaths, uh, uh, people feel this is not a correct term uh, because um, maybe that means it's the... Um, uh, it's we are referring to going beyond the EDD uh, specifically. So that's about the terminology. The last terminology that we need to know about is post maturity. So when we say post maturity, uh, technically or post maturity syndrome or dismaturity syndrome, what we are talking about is the pathological changes that we see in a um, baby that is born and has these uh, features that show that it's been in the um, abdomen or in the uterus for a long time. So that is what uh, post-maturity is. So we need to get this um, terminology understood. And um, generally speaking, post-deaths, post-term and prolonged pregnancy mean the same thing. It's only post-maturity that actually means a different thing, um, generally speaking. Um, so what, uh, how do we uh, make a diagnosis of this uh, post, post um, term pregnancy or a prolonged pregnancy? How do we make, make this diagnosis? Um, uh, first of all, we need to have um, accurate dating of the pregnancy. Um, that's the big thing. So for us to have accurate dating of the pregnancy, we need to have, um, to know exactly what the date uh, of the first day of the last normal menstrual period was. So if we know that date for sure, then we can date a pregnancy properly. Uh, so um, usually this is the case in people who keep diaries, which is rare in our setup. And also if the last normal menstrual period um, happened on a remarkable date, on a Christmas, on a New Year, on uh, Valentine's, so usually women will remember uh, these kinds of dates if they don't keep uh, diaries um, and so on. But generally, a woman uh, will not remember these dates. The other thing we need to note is that um, a woman who is using contraception uh, will not have accurate dates because even if she remembers the date, we cannot really uh, be certain about when ovulation happens because they were on contraception. And then um, the other thing that we need to um, look at if is if is if the woman was uh, breastfeeding again if a woman is breastfeeding that is a form of contraception we cannot tell exactly when she ovulated when she comes in pregnant so that's what we need to be uh, careful about. Um, then the other thing we use uh, to get that diagnosis is if a woman had a first trimester scan we know that the first trimester scan has an error of uh, one week, which is plus or minus week, or one week, and um, that uses uh, the crown ramp length to determine the gestation age. Then we have a second trimester scan. If we have a second trimester scan, usually that uses the biparietal diameter um, uh, 
so if that is measured to estimate the gestation age, we can also use that scan, uh, use the bipartite diameter in the second trimester to determine the um, uh, gestation age if that that is available. We know a third trimester scan is very inaccurate. It's it's um, it's um, its error is um, up to three weeks. So it's not a good scan to determine, uh, to verify the gestation age of the woman. And therefore that is not uh, generally used. It's as good as a clinical um, estimation. So that is about scan. The other thing we use to estimate um, the dates of a, um, of a pregnancy, how old the pregnancy is, is um, quickening. So normally we quickening is the first time that a woman uh, felt fetal movements. So if we um, decide, uh, if a woman tells us the day that she felt fetal movements or the week that she felt fetal movements, we can estimate if she's a prime gravida, we know that she was around um, 18 to 20 weeks at that time, then we can add from that time the weeks that have passed and add on to 18 to 20 weeks to estimate her gestation age. Um, if she's a multigravida, somebody who has had more than one pregnancy, then we can estimate that the time she felt fetal movement, fetal movements, um, she was around 16 to 18 weeks. So we can just add from the time she felt movements to now, how many weeks have passed, then we add to 16 to 18 weeks to estimate her gestation age. So that's how we normally would um, verify uh, the gestation age. Sometimes we use... Um, uh, examination findings. So clinically, if a woman came early uh, for antenatal, then she was examined. We find that her pregnancy was, um, the height of fundus at that point was 16 weeks. Usually before 20 weeks, the, the height of fundus or the symphysis of fundus height really uh, is close to the actual gestation age. So if a woman was 16 weeks when she started antenatal uh, care, she was around uh, 20 weeks, and we know that, you know, the sufficient of under height or the height of under is somewhere in between the umbilicus and the sufficient of under and the symphysis pubis around 16 weeks. It's around the umbilicus at 20 weeks. We can take that as a gestation age at that point and try to add the weeks that have passed to try and estimate um, the gestation age. So these are some of the methods that we can use to kind of um, figure out what her gestation is. And then once we uh, conclude that she's indeed uh, post deaths, then um, we can look for pathological reasons why this woman could be post deaths And there's a um, list. There are fetal causes and there are maternal causes. Fetal causes include... Um, Things like an encephaly, um, uh, fetal adrenal hypoplasia, um, uh, other conditions that uh, affect the brain, um, pituitary uh, and uh, hypothalamic abnormalities. All these um, things can cause um, uh, post uh, post deaths. Uh, maternal. Uh, causes include, um, you know, obesity, uh, lack of an active um, lifestyle, um, genetic causes. It's been found that if a grandmother was post-dates, her grandchild is more likely to be having pregnancies that are post-dates. Um, on fetal causes, you could add a male child as something that uh, predisposes to uh, to post-dates. Um so generally, those are the um, list of um, causes. Then there's a placental causes. The one listed there is a placental sulfatase um, deficiency as one of the uh, things that can uh, cause um, a post-death pregnancy. So what are the problems with a, a post-death pregnancy? So... Uh, we can start with maternal problems. So the problem with the um, post-death pregnancy is it brings anxiety, worry to the mother. Why is she not delivering? Why is the labor not starting? Is there something wrong with her baby? 
is there something wrong with her pregnancy? So it's a really uh, big cause of anxiety, antepartum. Then um, the fetus grows uh, big. It's a cause of macrosomia, and we know macrosomia can cause delivery uh, problems. It can cause um, reduced uh, lycor volume uh, because um, as the pregnancy goes beyond uh, post deaths, the placenta ages, it undergoes um, calcification, fetal perfusion uh, gets impaired. If fetal perfusion gets impaired, uh, the fetal circulation uh, prioritizes blood circulation to the brain. And therefore, the urine uh, blood supply to the kidneys get reduced and the urine uh, gets reduced. So these uh, women who come in with um, an oligohydramnios. So those are the um, problems that can arise as a result of post deaths A big baby, uh, oligohydramnios, um, and um, those are the things that um, women can come with. Also, because of a prolonged pregnancy, the fetus can uh, pass uh, meconium and the meconium and the lycor becomes meconium stained. Uh, the cord can use some, can lose some of its Watton's jelly and it loses some of its cushioning and therefore it can become easily uh, compressed. So those are some of the things that happen as a result of um, uh, a post-death um, uh, pregnancy. Now, when we come uh, to the problems uh, during labor, of course, we've talked about oligohydramnios and the risk of cord compression and fetal distress. Fetal distress is also as a result of um, uh, impaired placental uh, perfusion. Uh, labor is prolonged um, because the baby is big. There's a risk of shoulder distortion. There's a risk of um, increased um, operative deliveries, increased risk of caesarean section, increased risk of meconium aspiration syndrome because of the meconium that is um, uh, found in, um, in the lyco at this point. There's also uh, an increased risk of genital tract trauma, tears, uh, vaginal tears and so on. There's an increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage as well. Postpartum hemorrhage is a, res uh, is a result of the uterus failing to contract. You remember that this is the uterus that failed to initiate labor. And once labor starts, it also fails to contract uh, once the, the baby is delivered, uh, predisposing a woman to a tonic uterus. And also the big baby also predisposes um, uh, this woman to atonic uterus and postpartum hemorrhage as um as we've already said so how do we um manage uh, post uh death pregnancy so um once we make that diagnosis uh we need to um, uh, discuss with the woman we need to discuss the risks um and so on of post death pregnancies and then um really um, we need to deliver uh, this patient. Of course, the patient needs to agree with the delivery plan. We need to talk and discuss and get to the woman to understand. Um, if um, conservative management is um, chosen, then this woman needs to have um, a fetal monitoring, if you can do biophysical profile, if you can do kick charts, if you can do a stress test, all those things can be done to kind of um, assure uh, the woman of, of fetal well-being as she waits for spontaneous labor to start. But most of the time, the woman will agree that uh, she needs to be delivered. We need to just check that there's no contraindication for um, vaginal delivery. If there's a contraindication for vaginal delivery, uh, if there's a contraindication for induction of labor, then this woman will, uh, will go for caesarean section. If there's no contraindication for uh, for induction of labor, there's no contraindication for a vaginal delivery, then we have to assess this woman, look at all the risks, look at the size of the baby, look at the lycra volume, Look at the fact that there is no signs of any fetal compromise. If there's none of that, then we need to do what is called a bishop's call. So 
you look at dilatation first, you look at um, the effacement of the cervix, those are the parameters of the bishop's score, you look at the station uh, of the presenting part, you look at the consistency of the cervix, um, is it soft, is it uh, firm, is it hard, you look at the position of the cervix, is it posterior, is it anterior, is it in the middle. So all these things give you an idea of um, the probability of a successful induction of labor. Um, so once you calculate the bishop score, it's above 6 or 7, um, then you know that the probability of a vaginal delivery is good, then you can just induce labor. And we usually would induce labor with several methods are there, uh, depending on the parameters that a woman has, her parity, her gravidity, her gestation age, all these things uh, we put into account before we induce the labor. But anyway, we just need to know that we induce the labor for now, and uh, we know that the higher the gestation, the lower the dose of those inducing agents we can use. So we can use a catheter, we can use um, misoprostol, and we can use oxytocin. Um, there's also, if a woman is not ready to be delivered, there's also what is called sweeping of the membranes. So we go into uh, the cervix and just uh, move around um, the finger in this manner around the cervix. And uh, that sweeping of the membranes um, helps to stimulate production of prostaglandins and labor um, and so on. So, so we have to induce the labor. And once we induce the labor and the woman is um, uh, dilated enough, we need to do an early rupture of membranes. Because remember, we are suspecting that there might be meconium in the lycra. And also that uh, the rupturing of the membranes helps us monitor uh, the coming in of fetal distress because one of the signs of fetal distress is uh, meconium stain lycra. So the coming in of the, um, the rupturing of the membranes makes the lycra visible for monitoring and therefore easy for us to detect fetal distress. So once the labor is established, we need to uh, keep uh, monitoring the fetal heart up a protocol um, you know, like hourly in the um, in the latent phase of labor, maybe every 30 minutes in the active phase of labor, we need to just look out for uh, for that fetal distress. And then if we have a CTG monitoring, um, if we have a cardiotocograph, we can put that electronic fetal monitoring to monitor how the fetus is doing uh, during the labor. Uh, we have to be aware of the complications of um, uh, post death pregnancy, the high risk of fetal distress. We need to have our resuscitators ready. We need to be aware of um, the possibility of shoulder dystocia. Uh, we need to be aware of the need uh, for caesarean section that might arise uh, for this uh, patient. And we need to just keep in our mind that the caesarean section is a possibility due to the uh, complications of um, this uh, post uh, death pregnancy. So generally, that's how we uh, manage uh, a post-death pregnancy. So the objectives of this um, short uh, discussion was to just uh, tell us what a post-death uh, pregnancy is, what a post-term pregnancy is, uh, what post-maturity is, and also what... Um, uh, we need to know in the managing of um, the patients who are post-term. Um, so thank you for listening and we'll see you in the next one.